We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and welcome to our 2024 season predictions because the 2024 season starts next week. We're finally so here. We're finally, finally here. We made it through the win- the dreaded winter break. It felt like so long, though, like actually. Oh, and see, for me, because I'm in busy season for work, it right. felt so short. Like everything went by so quickly. So I feel like I blinked and we're in the 2024 season already. But yeah, I mean, it just it feels like so long ago that I was binging my way through all of those um, races from the 2020. Uh, what well, words, Catherine? The 2016 season for yeah. Catherine watched the 26 season, 2016 season. So you don't have to. Um, but yeah, it's I'm so glad we're back. We're going to be getting uh, Drive to Survive in a couple of days when this episode comes out. Um, and yeah, it's it's it's. I'm really excited for the season. I think it's going to be a really, really good one. Yeah, I'm excited too for it to be the first full season that we watch or like that's on yeah. and we're doing the podcast. So that'll be fun for us to do as well. Um, more podcasts coming out, more content. It's going to be great. So excited. Yep, we will we will be back to our uh, race previews and race recaps um, and all of those fun things. And we'll talk a little bit more about some stuff that we talked about last season that we're going to be doing this year later on in the pod. Um, but to start off, there have been a number of rules changes um, that will be implemented for this season. And uh, we got some thoughts on them. Um, yeah, I, I don't love. Do not love. Yeah. There, there's some that are fine and some that are less fine um, and some that, you know, I I didn't put all the rules changes in. If you want, there's an article on formula1.com that details all of them. But the one from the ones that stood out to us specifically, one of them is the right to review where teams can try to revisit a decision that's been ruled upon at a race by the stewards. For example, Lewis Hamilton and Charles Leclerc's uh, disqualifications at Cota last season. Um, the amount of time that a team has to revisit one of these decisions has been drastically shortened from 14 days to four days. That's insane. Yeah. I don't like, like, I, I agree two weeks is a very long time, but going from two weeks to four days is absolute insanity. I mean, I know yeah. that there's also like the potential for an extension in cir- certain circumstances, but th- it's too short. It's so it's like you can't just cut it down that much. Yeah, I don't know why and someone so- would need two weeks, but still, at the same time, like four days seems incredibly short. Yeah, and the fact that teams will have to pay like a deposit for a review attempt is like I know it's probably going to you know um the the FIA president's slush fund or whatever or hopefully like the rainy day fund um but it, it it's it's just it's very interesting that you have to like put money on a hold that you'll get it back if you're successful or if the FIA deems that for whatever reason they want to give you the money back, which I basically think means that like, they're not actually going to take this money at all. So it just, it strikes me as like really weird. And I, I don't even think it's going to be like a deterrent for right of review because right of review really like, it doesn't happen all that often in the grand scheme of a full season. No, I think it's more to discourage teams from wanting to review anything under the sun I think it's That's super fair. vague and wishy-washy where it's like, oh, if we deem it fair, we'll give it back to you. But if we don't, you may lose this money that you've put on hold. Yeah. But I do think it's meant for discouraging teams because with two weeks, if you think about it logically, you have time to sit and process and think through if you really want to you know, move forward with the right of review. Moving from 14 days to four days, teams might be more trigger happy to jump and do that without having – you know, two weeks to process and really look at details and and see if they want to move forward with the right of review. So I think they've shortened it and they've put that in there just to make sure teams are serious on, you know, moving forward with a a right of review. How many times can I say moving forward with a right of review in one sentence? Um, Yeah. But that's that's what I I think think the logic is behind it, which is fine. Like, I get it. 
Yeah, and I mean, I think like really the the most times where we had like a rear, weird off the wall team going on to to question something and asking for right of a review was last year with Haas. You know, a couple weeks after the fact, they were asking about track limits. I don't remember which race it was, but it was like it was weeks after the race, and they're like, "Oh, by the way, we're you know." we we want to discuss this because we think that people should have been disqualified. So I think that's that's probably what it is. But with a new person in charge of Haas this, this season, they might not be as trigger happy for these like little nitpicky type of things. So we'll yeah. see. Well, we will see. Another one that I'm like really questioning is oh, yeah. the maximum fine. So the maximum fine by the stewards previously, they could impose $250,000, euro, sorry, uh, worldly here euro fine and that has been now moved to a million euros which is yeah. insane because that's about the salary of some of the second year drivers that's more than the salary of some of these drivers like let's yeah. be let's be real here like because i think we all max think can it, afford it right but... we all think of it as like max and lewis and charles with his crazy insane contract and you know stroll with daddy stroll banking bankrolling him so like yes they have unlimited funds or what seems like unlimited funds but at the same time it's a very small portion of the drivers on the track i i don't like this i think even two hundred and fifty thousand is a lot um compared yeah. to their salaries if we're trying to make this comparable to salaries it's it's too high yeah it, it's like who's you know and and they're also very vague on like what warrants a million euro fine. Like, does you know do what? What could it, like is a driver gonna like pull out a weapon? Like pull out a knife on the middle of in the middle of a race? Like like what qualifies as a, a million euro fine? Like know. you know, are we gonna have a, another um, Spygate incident? Like there, there's really or or Crashgate? Like why did they need to do this? Is my question. Yeah, like what is what warrants them raising it, and what would warrant a one million dollar fine? Because this isn't in total for the year. This is one individual fine, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's 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 one you know individual t monetary penalty for one thing that a driver probably not one thing a driver did. If to get to a million, you'd have to have like a a pattern of a like pattern. a Pastor Maldonado esque pattern of behavior. Sorry, I keep yeah. going back to Maldonado, but he is the most penalized uh, driver in, in Formula One history, I believe. Um, but yeah, I just I. Like even the the biggest fine that was handed out last season, I think, was for Lewis crossing the live track um, right. when he almost got run over by his teammate, um, or could have been run over by his teammate, and that was like fifty thousand euros, which is a heavy fine that is you know pocket change to Lewis Hamilton, but it's still like that's the that's the biggest penalty we've seen. So why do we need to raise it, you know, four times? Again, I think it's really just to discourage drivers from doing anything that would warrant a penalty, uh, a fine, not a penalty. A once, fine. A, once again, I say that in the long list of things that the FIA needs to deal with to make the sport better, this is not it. I know. I love how we're getting new rule changes around stuff that like really doesn't matter and things that should yeah. change. They aren't changing, which brings us to our next rule change <laughs> of the sprint format, which we've gone and talked about at nauseum about the sprint format, old and new. Both are miserable yes. and terrible. Do not like it. But, like, put the energy and the effort into fixing the sprint format, please. Yeah. That's that's really... You know, I, I put that I put this in the rundown just to remind everyone that the sprint format has changed. Um, if you want to go back, I will link um, to the winter break recap episode um, if you're watching this on YouTube. So you can listen to our, our full on rant about it and the full on format. It's going to be terrible. Um, but moving on, and this is actually a rule that I do like, is that there I are agree. even stricter halo requirements for the roll hoop on top of the car they have to withstand a, a stricter load uh to make them more robust and this has been coming in the last couple of years primarily based on uh Zhou Guan Yu's 
horrific rollover ca- crash at Silverstone um, in 2022. So this is like, this is a rule that's actually beneficial. We like seeing improvements on safety. Keep doing more yeah. of those things. Yeah, no, I support this rule. Always support safety. I still think it's wild that we didn't have halos for the longest time. Right. Like I, I just watching some of these crashes without halos are insane um, and terrifying. So I'm glad that they're, you know, focusing on safety on some of these rules. Yeah. Like the, the 2016 Fernando Alonso crash in Australia, like yeah. he flipped twice and I mean, he had a pneumothorax, but he did walk away from it. Um, yeah. But that's, it, that wasn't that it's long insane. Ago. Like, you know, like, and oh the, yeah. The halo the... was only implemented in 2018. Yeah. Which is insane to think it's only been around for such a short amount of time. Right. Wild. Wild, wild, wild. Yeah. And the last rule that's like one of the more, you know, significant notable is um, they have changed when DRS is made available at the beginning of races. Usually it is available on lap three. It is now going to be available a lap sooner on lap two. Um, and the same for on a safety car restart. So it's going to be, you know, one lap earlier than usual, which is, I think that's going to actually be really interesting for, you know, especially some of those really close starts that we've been seeing the, the last last few years, um, that this will definitely give people, you know, more of an advantage to try to go, you know, to take over P1 from P2, um, you know, early on at the start of the race and not giving that person who's in P1 that opportunity, you know, as much of an opportunity to just drive off into the sunset. No, I definitely think this will have us have not like a closer start, but a closer first few laps because it'll be I think it'll be interesting. Yeah, I know people have a a lot of like mixed opinions about DRS. And as somebody who, you know, didn't watch Formula One in the pre-DRS era, um, I I don't hate it because it's the the only thing that that I know. Um, but I do think that this is, you know, it beneficial. This will, this will be helpful to, to bringing in some more excitement during the races and especially like the beginning portions of the race, which are already exciting enough. Um, so I, I'm going to be really interested to see how this, you know, really impacts a race as a whole. No, I definitely agree on all points. Yeah. I like when rules like actually affect positive change, (laughs) right? It, it shouldn't be few, that hard. But... And then also, I know it's not necessarily in our rundown, but the radio. That one is a change yeah. for this year, right? I'm pretty sure that they have implemented a um, change. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I've got the UCLA game on in the background, and one of the UCLA's players just got ejected. Um, so that's fun. Um, but anyway, um, I do believe that they are going to be implementing some, basically you can't curse on the radio restrictions, which is, I think when, when I first talked about this, that that was the first time that, that I said, this is something that, you know, F1 doesn't need to fix and F1 should be focusing on the things that that do cause issues. And like cursing is bad, but you know, a seven-year-old who's watching a Formula One race and sees a bunch of asterisks on the little caption when Yuki is upset about something, um, like, they're, they're not going to know. No. I mean, I did drop my first F-bomb at, like, six years old, but that's an entirely unrelated story. I was <laughs> echoing, so. No, I think it's, like, the radio calls are half the fun of watching the race. Uh, not yeah. half, less than half but they're still fun to watch and they provide good entertainment and good just Mm -hmm. information and context for certain things and I like the radio calls I think it'll really be different and I don't think we'll hear as many just because I think people will really have to think too much about what they say and when you're pulling g's and driving so fast you shouldn't have to like sit and monitor what you're saying right that's not something you're like necessarily paying attention to so I don't know I think it's dumb but we'll see how this year goes yeah not 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 my not my most ideal and I it just it reminds me of the radio restrictions back in like the 2016 season which were significantly stricter than what we have now so at least we're not going all the way back there where basically drivers had a list of like 25 things that they were allowed to radio about so we don't have that but we still have like <laughs> fix the other aspects of the sport that need to be fixed 
don't fix freak the sprint out about. race and then we'll figure out everything else <laughs> yeah fix the sprint race and then we can deal with with like yuki saying the word sometimes yeah anyways yeah all right are you ready to get into our predictions i am i'm actually really excited about this i me too yeah i think so i've got some good predictions Following this new format we have with uh, Catherine and I making decisions and not telling each other, which is we sh- should continue to do this in mm-hmm. our predictions throughout the season. So yes. we have several categories for predictions for the 2024 season. We've both made some picks. We'll both have commentary on each other's, I'm sure. But looking at the podium for cons- uh, Drivers Championship, so uh, one, two, and three in the driver's championship. Um, top three in constructors. Biggest, like, good surprise coming out of a whole team. And then a disappointment coming out of a team. A surprise driver as well as disappointment from a driver. And then also what we think will be our favorite and our least favorite races for this season. Yes. So. Yes. Because we've Yay. got opinions on all of them. On all of them. Buckle in for a lot. Get ready for it. <laughs> yes. So, Catherine, top three. Do you Did you pick P1, P2, P3, or did you just do a top three? I did pick P1, P2, P3. Okay. Um, obviously, I picked Max to repeat again as champion. Obviously. Um, I mean, just based on what people are saying about the Red Bull car, like, I think I non-Red Bull fans have every reason to be worried. Um, so I've got Max in P1. Um, I actually have Carlos Sainz in P2. I think, that, I think he's going to go off the wall, crazy great, and really just show Ferrari what they're losing. Um, and then I have, I have Checo in P3. Because it's either Checo's in P3 or P2, or he gets switched halfway through the season with Daniel and goes down to V-carb. I love how we're calling it V-carb now. That makes me happy. Yeah. I'm, it's. We want me to call him Cash App, RB. Like, I'm not going to do it. Team sorry, Carbolo. not sorry. That's my, I think that's my favorite. Carbolod. Um, Okay, yeah. so, yes, obviously I have Max in... P1 winning another driver's championship. Mm-hmm. I don't get over it. It's fine. The thing is, like, I love to hate him, right? Because he's obviously not a driver for my team, but he's wildly talented and I respect it. And I'll give credit where credit's due. Checo doesn't get credit, but Max gets credit because Max is a very <laughs> strong driver. Yeah. 2024, everybody. And Emily still doesn't like Checo. Um, Shocking. P2, <laughs> P2, I have Lando. So okay. I think. I know, I know. But I think this is the season we see him get a win. Um, Fingers crossed. I think he did really, really well towards the end of the season last season. And I think he's just going to continue. He's, you know, a really, really strong driver. So I think uh, he'll end up P2. And then P3, I do have Carlos. Um, Again, I think it's going to be a, hey, Ferrari, look what you don't have next season. I'm leaving you for insert team here. Um, actually he's yeah. not leaving them. They've dropped him, but, but yeah. you get the sentiment, you get the sentiment. Uh, so that's who I have for my drivers. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with you that like Lando's going to have a standout year. I also think that he's going to win the first race of his career. Um, I want him to win a race. I also want Fernando to win a race. Um, I want more race winners just in general. Um, I can yes. definitely see Lando, you know, going, um, No, I completely agree. Like, obviously, I would love to see Lando win another race or win a race and Fernando win another race, like you said. I'd love to see Carlos win a race this season. I'd love to see anybody win a race. I like when there's more race winners and it's not just like Red Bull, Red Bull, Red Bull, Red Bull. It's it's more exciting when other people win races. So, yeah, even I can agree with that. Yeah. Okay, so for the Constructors Championship, what teams do you have finishing in the top three? I think it should come to no surprise that I am predicting another Red Bull Constructors win. Um, I also think that based on what we've been hearing from McLaren, I think that McLaren are going to leapfrog over both Mercedes and Ferrari. So I have them in P2 and then I have Ferrari in P3 because I just, I don't know how things are going to go with Mercedes this year. 
Yeah, Mercedes, I feel like there's a lot of question marks, which is also, I have the same, 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 but different. So I have Red Bull P1 again, unfortunately. And then I have Ferrari P2 and McLaren P3. I just, I, I don't know what's going to come out of Mercedes this season. I think Lando is going to be super strong. And Oscar Piastri was great last season as a rookie. Oh, One yeah. season under his belt. I think he's going to have a great season. And Ferrari, I think Carlos and Charles are really going to challenge each other, which will drive them to get more points. Distraction. Or distraction. Um, Sorry. <laughs> No, it's totally fair. Uh, but yeah, I just I don't think they have enough to to beat out Red Bull. I think they're going to throw everything at it, but I don't think they will. But at the same time, I do want to caveat this with Ferrari knows they're getting Lewis next season. Could they just throw this season away? I don't know. I mean, I don't think they I... would throw it away completely, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I it's it's definitely, you know, there's there's the chance that they'll want to do with like, you know, Haas's 2021 season was the lost year that they knew was going to be the lost year because they were focusing on the regulation change and making the 2022 car better. Right. Um, so they just, you know, had, you know, uh, Mick Schumacher and Nikita Mazepin languishing at the back of the grid. So Ferrari might take that route um, and... I don't know necessarily if they should or they should not. I think it really just depends on how much of them taking that route means screwing over their drivers or specifically screwing over their ex, their driver who is leaving after the end of the year. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's a lot to, lot to see this season from Ferrari. <laughs> so yeah, we'll see. Oh, okay. I like our picks. We'll have to revisit and see how we actually did at the end of the season Um, oh yeah but now for a good surprise coming out of a full team so not just like one driver doing better than we thought they would or you know something like that but a whole team being a good surprise on the grid this season who you got I actually picked Visa Cash App RB um our our good old friends at Carver (laughs) I so the reason why I picked them as as biggest surprise is I feel like they are going to be the top midfield team of the year. I do too, and I so I agree and I don't. I feel like they could even maybe leapfrog Mercedes because if they're going off of the the Red Bull car last season, that car is really really good. Even if cars mm-hmm. get a little bit better, that car is still going to perform really really well. Who knows what's happening at Mercedes? I feel like they could be like first one off the podium. I really do. Depending on yeah. how Yuki and Danny drive, um, I also so I was between two. I ended up with um, carbohydrate team. However, I think Williams is also going to have a really good season this year, coming off of all Agreed. the success that Albon had last year and. At the end of last season, I was really high on Williams. I'm still really high on Williams. I think it'll be like it. We won't necessarily be talking about you know McLaren and Aston Martin right in the mix four or five. I think it's going to be uh, V Carb and Williams this year. Yeah, the, I the think battle Aston that we saw at fall. the end of last year is is going to continue this year. And then yeah, Aston Martin's a really big question mark. Yeah, I just I don't know where they're gonna end up. I haven't heard a lot coming out of that team, um, but you have Fernando Alonso, so you never really know, you know what yeah. you're gonna. You could do a lot with a little because um, he's such a great driver. But I think between V Carb and Williams, it's gonna be really, a really interesting fight at the top of like the midfield teams. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so on the flip side, <laughs> who do you think will be a big disappointment? <laughs> As a team, I picked Mercedes. I I I think that Mercedes is going to I mean, not that I think that the car is the main reason why Lewis left Mercedes. Obviously, if you watch the winter break uh, part three episode, you will hear all of the reasons why Lewis made the jump. But clearly, not having a competitive car is one of the reasons why he's leaving, whether he's ever going to say that or not. So yeah. my my biggest concern is that Mercedes is just really not going to, to be good this year. And now, 
when I think disappointment and underperforming, I don't mean that they're going to be like seventh in the championship. Right. They're probably going to be somewhere in like the, the fourth or fifth positions. Like that, that would be, I mean, finishing P5 would be devastating for Toto and, and co. Um, but I, I do think that they will underperform and it, it really is going to hinge on, you know, can George take a leadership role in a team that Lewis is leaving and can Lewis not want to drive this car off a cliff? Like he wanted to drive the car off a cliff last year. Cause it was just so upsetting to him. And it's just so bad. Yeah. I think that garage has fallen apart a little bit to be completely mm-hmm. honest. I don't think they have a leader in George. Maybe I'm wrong. He just doesn't seem like the take charge and lead a team. He's just been really struggling. Like last year was not he did like, not he... have a great year last year. I just I don't know. I think the pressure is kind of getting to him. Lewis leaving, he's gonna feel like he has to fill those shoes. He can't. They'll probably bring in a really experienced driver. George will have to take another step back. Like I just think there's a lot going on there that is gonna be a huge distraction and not be helpful for the team this year. Just with Lewis leaving, it's his last season with Mercedes and all of that. I think there's a lot of noise and they won't be able to truly yeah. focus. Um, so no, I think that's a, that's a really good call. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in a out of left field, probably would not expect me to pick this as a big disappointment. Um, but again, I picked it based on expectations. I picked Ferrari. So okay. I, I don't think they're going to have the season they think they're going to have. I think they're going to underperform for, you know, Ferrari. And I'm sure they're going to make a thousand and one strategy mistakes that are just not needed. Um, If Ferrari's strategy was better last year, they would have ended the season, you know, ahead of Mercedes, but they didn't. And I feel like there's just going to be a lot of small things that add up to a big, you know, swing in points that they won't be able to make up. Because if Ferrari had better strategy and and they drove a little bit better, they would have won more than one race last season. But I think it's it's really just, you know, down to the strategy. So maybe we'll say the biggest disappointment is going to be Ferrari's strategy department. Um, But I don't think... Ferrari is going to have the season everyone is hoping for coming off of last season. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see that. I think that, you know, they're, they're going to struggle with the things that Ferrari struggles with every year. And that doesn't even speak to, there were reliability issues that we, that we saw last year that they definitely need to solve. Like, you know, Charles Leclerc crashing into a wall on the formation lap can't happen again. (sighs) Hey, at least it wasn't a double DNF. Um, That's true. But no, I think <laughs> I think there's just going to be a lot of noise around Ferrari this year too, with like Lewis coming next season and everyone just wanting to know about that. And I think again, this garage is going to have a lot of distractions because of the the Lewis move. So, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh well. Moving on. Are we? Do you have any other surprise or disappointment, like honorable mentions? Um, I think for honorable mention, I'd throw Alpine into the mix. I I think like who's Alpine? That, exactly. <laughs> um, I and that's why I didn't pick them because they're so irrelevant. It, ex- exactly. Like I just I think that they're you know go, based you know going off of of what happened last season. I think that that is unfortunately going to continue. Ah. Dinner time. Dinner time for Bishop. Um. So yeah, I think my my honorable mention is, but it's like. Is Alpine disappointing a disappointment because it's not a surprise? They're just kind of like there. Yeah. I don't know. They're just, it's they're like, just there. It's like I can't I don't we're know not gonna say Haas on because Alpine. Haas. <laughs> I, know, I know, right? We just like did a hardcore on Alpine and we are just dogging them in every single podcast we have now, but I don't know. Maybe they'll prove us wrong i just highly don't i mean maybe but it's like we can't say you know the biggest disappointment is going to be haas because no because we know that haas is going to struggle exactly our expectation is for them to take p19 and p20 yeah so which is unfortunate 
but yeah. is and is I'm the not reality. gonna say like oh they're gonna be a surprise because they're not gonna get last like that's again not a surprise it's just right how it all shakes out but speaking of surprises who is your surprise driver for 2024 um, I think my pick's going to be a little bold, um, but I have Zhou Guan Yu as Ooh. my breakout driver. I think he's going to have a breakout year and that he is going to do <clears throat> what Alex Albon did in the Williams last year and outdrove that car. I think that, that Guan Yu, Zhou Guan Yu is going to do that for what is their team is stick or kick. Whoever well, it the depends heck they on are. what race. It depends what race we're in. Um, what country? what country are we in uh no I I love this I love Joe Guan Yu I think he's still kind of like coming into his own it's only a second year on track now or last year was the second year going into his third year so he has two seasons under his belt is what I was trying to say sorry yeah um but I think he's really he really has to drive for his life and drive for a seat next season yeah because like he only has a contract through this year he will either leave the grid or find a seat or remain at stake next, whatever team we're calling it. So I think this season is so, so important for him to really prove to people that he still deserves to stay in F1 and, and, and keep a seat. Um, so I love this. Yeah. I, I can, I can see it for sure. Yeah. I just, I, for whatever reason, I just have this feeling that he's going to like out drive that car, um, which is, it's probably not going to be a good car. Um, it's going to be a very loudly green car as we've discussed in our, uh, livery, uh, reaction episode. Um, but I, I think that he's going to, you know, I, I hope that the, the car is going to be more reliable because reliability was one of their biggest issues last year. Yeah. Lots of, issues even more so car. than Ferrari. Yeah. No, I love that. I do love that pick. Um, I went with Logan Sargent. I feel like okay. We, I know. I feel like we really dogged him last season. Maybe we're not. We were not all that fair to him. Um, I think his second season is going to be stronger. He's driven all the tracks now and is maybe more comfortable with the car. It seems like James is really excited to work with him and, you know, talks highly of him. So that gives me a little bit more faith because I'll trust James Wells to the end of the earth. Um, oh, yeah. But I think Sargent's going to score some points this season. I think the Williams car is going to be stronger this season. So I think we're going to see some bigger things coming out of Logan Sargent compared to last season. Like last season, he was the American who crashed every single race. You know what I mean? So this season, I feel like we're going to get a big improvement from that. Um, and and we'll see some points out of him that he actually scores and he doesn't get them by default. Correct. So yes. I think we're actually going to get some real points from him this season. Um, so I'm excited to, to see what comes out of him and the Williams. Yeah, I can definitely see him having a lot more of those first American to do X, Y, Z since 1980, whatever. Um, And, you know, I like Williams as a team. I like their lineup and it would be nice to see them successful. And it would also be nice to, you know, not have Alex Albon have to, you know, will the team to, uh, you know, up the up the standings on his own, which is really, you know, last year was all Alex Albon. And maybe right. a little well, Logan Sargent with some decent qualifying. One point from Logan. One. Let's not forget. Uh, but no, I, I completely agree. And if, and if the Williams is the car just improves from last season, Alex Albon really was hitting a stride. And if Sargent really gets comfortable, I feel like that team will be much more competitive than they were or have yeah. been in the last several years. So, Agreed. Um, so this is my favorite part of the episode where we talk about the biggest disappointment of drivers, which is basically us just shitting on people. Um, so Catherine, who is your biggest disappointment this season? So not to continue dogging on Alpine, but I picked both Alpine drivers. I, I I think that we are going to see both Akon and Gasly underperform this year. Um, it just occurred to me that um, Pierre Gasly is a former Red Bull driver who is now driving at Renault and not doing very well at Renault. When is the last time that happened? 
Danny Ricardo, Danny Ricardo. And look what happened to him. Um, and you know, obviously, Gasly had to leave what was Alpha Tauri at some point, but. I, I, like I said earlier, I just don't think that Alpine is going to, you know, I think they're going to struggle this year. I think that they're definitely going to underperform and, and slide down the grid. Um, and I, I think that from a driver's perspective, I think that the drivers aren't going to know what to do with their car. No, I think that's a, that's a good call. I mean, I, again, it's hard to be a disappointment when you're already kind of irrelevant. Um, True. I do, I do agree on your you know, points and assessment of, of Alpine this year. I mean, and it's not like it I can a, say in that, another you know, episode where that like Gasly is just going to disappear and, and not be relevant this season. Like there's not going to be a lot coming from him. So this is in line with, you know, how we've been talking. Yeah. Which is really unfortunate because he's a very strong driver. I mean, he's the only Alpha Tauri victory in a long time, even though that race was weird, which is what led to him, you know, being at the top of the, the grid, but that that's what happens. Um, but yeah, I mean, and it's not like I can say, you know, Lewis Hamilton is going to be the most, the biggest disappointment, you know, on, on the grid this year. Cause that would just be, you know, me not being a Ferrari or a Mercedes fan or a Ferrari fan soon. It will be soon. That would have been a correct statement. Um, so, so yeah, I just, I, I think that Alpine, has expectations that they're not going to be able to meet this year yeah speaking of expectations that they can't meet hmm. you're not gonna believe this one but i picked charles leclerc i had a feeling you would yeah so again maybe it's because i expect a lot out of him as a ferrari fan but i also just think like for how much added help he gets from the team versus carlos and how good he is a really good driver. He just can't convert. Like how many pole yeah. positions did he have last year where he didn't even get P2? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's just so many instances where he comes to the track and just, I don't want to say shits the bed, but he does not convert. He doesn't take advantage of the opportunities and he just doesn't perform well. And again, he is a really good driver. He did great last season. Great you know, take that word how you want it. But it's not like he had a horrible season where he finished at the very, very back of all the drivers. Right. But he, he didn't perform to his expectation. And now with him having this, like, crazy long, crazy expensive Ferrari contract, they're going to want to see results. And I don't think he's going to be able to perform and and live up to the expectations that are being set for him. And I think it's going to be really hard for him next season having to drive with Lewis. Yeah, I think that's gonna, there, there's so many question marks surrounding, you know, Mer Mercedes and Ferrari with the, with the, those, those two drivers, especially, um, that it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be really interesting, but it, it, it honestly does not surprise me that you picked Leclerc to be your, your biggest disappointment for a driver this season. And, and who knows, maybe he'll have the off season of his life and he is going to be a completely new driver by the time he gets back on the grid um, at Bahrain. But yeah, well, also I just, he's just like not focused. He's out here putting out music and like, not I know, right. On F1. I mean, good for him. He's super talented and can do whatever he wants in the off season, obviously making jokes that he's not focused. I know he's a very focused athlete, but like it's just I can't get over the music bit of it. And we can't like all be Max Verstappen out. who spends his free time on the sim or streaming on on you know whatever he does on on video games. I don't oh, I'm not a gamer. God. I don't know what these terminologies are. Um, but yeah, I it's it, it we'll we'll see. I guess is I the know. moral story. We will see. Yeah. Oh, uh, but. I'm excited to see how everything turns out and shakes out, to be completely yeah. honest. Um, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I'm invested in every season, but I feel like with the podcast this season, I'm going to be, like, more invested and more excited than ever to watch all of this. Um, mm -hmm. Just because I feel like I'm seeing it from a different lens now. So I'm, I'm very excited for the season to get started. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Speaking of seasons to get started, we also picked Best Race, Worst Race, um, which did. is really hard to pick um because we don't have you know available weather outlooks for every race right in front of us um but i thought it would be fun to still include so emily what do you think is going to be the best race of the season so fully recognizing my hatred for sprint weekends 
I did pick a sprint weekend. I picked Brazil. Okay. I, I think last season Brazil was a great race. Super entertaining, super exciting to watch. Also, it's later in the season, so I feel like we have a closer, you know, grid and a closer race towards the end of the season because cars have kind of gotten figured out. Um, yeah. So I think Brazil is going to be another really exciting race. Also, because I know it's during the wet season of Brazil, so like weather will probably play a factor. Yeah. Um, but I'm excited to see how how that works out. Yeah, definitely. I also picked a late season race, or is it a late season this year? I think I, it is a late season uh, th- this year. I because I forget the regionalization has, has changed things. Um, it's but off. I. Yeah, it, the the fact that Suzuka is in April is just bananas to me. Wild. Um, but my pick for best race of the year is, um, and this is probably a bold choice, is I think that we're going to get another great Vegas race. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. I mean, it's I... going to be a mess. Like, everything surrounding it is going to be a disaster. But the race itself, I think we're going to get another really good, you know, showing out there. And hopefully the, you know, post-race podium stuff is, like, they streamline it a little bit. And they don't have to drive the drivers all the way to the, the Bellagio for the post-race interviews. You can just do it do it right where, where they usually do it. It's fine. I promise it's fine. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good call. I think last year was, I don't want to say, like, their test run because it was real. Um, but I feel like they learned a lot from last season. Yeah. And we're going to have all of our manhole covers absolutely glued down. Super glued down. Super glued. Gorilla glue that shit. Um, <laughs> but I think they're going to change, not change things, but fix the issues they had last season. And it's going to be a really, really good race this season. So that's a good call, Catherine. Yeah. One thing I will credit them, you know, so far it, that they've already fixed is the race times. Oh my at gosh, least I know. in relation to where you and I are going to be in the oh world, because we will both goodness. be in the United States. So the race times are now no longer in the middle of the night. So I'm not going to have to wake, stay awake until, you know, four or five o'clock in the morning to catch all the race coverage, which as somebody who likes sleep is really great for me. So they, they made it, you know, the normal times for a night race. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah, it's so much better. It was it was horrible last season, so I'm glad that they fixed that. Yeah, agreed. Catering to the Americans, God bless them. <laughs> and you know what? They can they can live with it for, you know, one race weekend evening. We only have 3 races in the entire season that are well, that's not a lie. Or that's a lie cuz Mexico and Brazil are pretty timely for us as well, but outside of the Americas races, everything is so brutal and that's only like Yeah. what a fifth of the season. So, exactly anyways um okay so then we have what we think will be our least favorite race or like the worst race of the season um yeah. this one was really hard for me I don't know if you had an easier time but what did you pick for for your worst race I mean it wasn't hard for me just because this is my least favorite track um and so I did pick Jetta. um I like it it has it I should have known it I has it has underperformed so far. I mean, even even more than the sprint races. I just don't like the the Jetta circuit um, that they use. And they've talked, you know, for a couple of years now about like a purpose built circuit in Jetta that you know they le- leaving aside the the you know fact that Jetta almost got bombed last year. Um, it's it's just it's not my favorite, and it's just it's not a good street track in my opinion. No, no. And now thinking about it, I should have guessed that you would have picked that. I had a harder time trying to pick. Yeah. I ended on Austria. Mainly okay. because of the issues last season. It's also, to me, it just seems like such a short circuit. And yeah. Well, because it, it is. But also, it, I don't know why, but of all the short circuits, this one just seems like they're going around like really quickly in a circle. I know they're not, but that's what it seems like to me. But they're not even doing that because they're going all over, off the li- off, getting track limits, track limits called. Like, how many penalties did we have last season? We didn't actually know the results because we had to look at things and people got penalized late. Like, it was just a cluster. I think it's too fast of a track, too. This and the. Um, the circuit's too short for them to actually give penalties real time. So I think it's just going to be a nightmare 
going forward. Like yeah, un- that's, until that's they actually point. fix the track, I think it's just going to be another another disaster like last season. So yeah, that's what yeah, I think. That's, last year. That's, that's a great point. I will also add as a you know asterisk caveat all the sprint weekends are probably going to suck in some way. I mean, Brazil will have some redeeming factors because Brazil is great, but I'm, I'm not looking for like the fact that they're reintroducing China as a sprint race is like, that's just mean. I hate that they're doing that. I hate it. Yeah. (sighs) Whatever. Yeah. I'm going to say they didn't ask us. I don't know why. Clearly not. (laughs) So, One of the things that we did um, last season is we picked our poll um, uh, P1 and podiums and P10s. um, And we decided this year that we want to actually keep track of that um, because we're both analytical people and we want to, you know, actually have like numbers in front of us of how well we've done. Um, So we have actually, you know, we're going to be doing a little uh, pick them game um, between ourselves. We'll get one point for um, picking the correct pole finisher three points for correctly um, picking p10 because i was really bad at it but emily was better and then five points for correctly picking the podium and this means correctly picking the podium places so if i have lando on the podium but he finished p2 instead of p3 like i picked then i will not get those points you have to get them all on the podium and all correctly um so that is um going to be a really uh fun little added challenge for us to keep track of as the season goes on and we will keep you appraised on um the uh who who is in the lead when as we go on I'm glad that we're giving ourselves points because last season I was like, oh, this is fun. Like, this is like who I'd like in an ideal world. And this is, you know, what I'm feeling today. But now knowing that there's points involved, watch out. It's oh, over. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get competitive. <laughs> the, the, the battle is on. Uh, it's so hard to pick some of these, though, especially like picking the oh, correct yeah. podium. P10 is, you know, a crapshoot. Um, so I'm excited, though. It'll be fun for us. Yeah. I'm also excited. We have um, added um, a, we're calling it the wild card and it's kind of like a bingo card, but instead of 25 um, things that we predict to happen, we have nine. But the way we did it is we have nine realistic predictions of things that we will see throughout the season. um, And also nine incredibly unrealistic things that we expect to see throughout the season. So, um, Check out our social media at going.off.track for the full list for some highlights to kind of um, see for the realistic ones. We have Max Verstappen converts a Leclerc pole to a win. Um, An all British podium is something that we might see. Um, Carlos Sainz getting screwed over by his team slash strategy. It rains at Spa. definitely see. Oh yeah, goodness. so so those are those are a few that we have picked for the realistic ones. Emily, do you want to pick out a couple of the uh, unrealistic ones to see? Oh yeah, let's start off with Checo gets another D- double DNF. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who put that on there. Um, Charles Leclerc wins Monaco. Yeah, to see it. Is it actually realistic? Probably not. Uh, also, Logan Sargent <laughs> lands on the podium again. Probably not, but. Uh, you never know. There are uh, some really good ones. I know Catherine would hate to see Lewis win the World Drivers Championship in his last year at Mercedes, but it's on there just in case he does. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that is another thing that we will kind of be be ticking off as as they as they uh, occur throughout the season. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm these these are some fun ones. I'm I'm really curious to see how many we mark off on the unrealistic list. I know I'd like to get at least a few. There's always the off chance that our unrealistic, we get more than our realistic. Probably yes, not, we'll but there's always a chance. There's always yeah. a chance. Oh, well, I am so, so excited for the 2024 season. And something I really enjoy that they have structured with F1 and Netflix is that the Drive to Survive comes out the week before so that you get to watch the whole last season. And then you have like a few days and then we go right into the first race of the season. So with that being said, our next episode is going to be a reaction to the uh, latest Drive to Survive season, season six. So we're going to watch it probably Thursday night at midnight when it comes out and binge watch it and not sleep all night. And then 
give our reaction on our next episode. So we'll see how our predictions and what we wanted to see on Drive to Survive compares to the actual product, um, yes. which I'm really excited about. Yeah, I, I think this is going to be a fun season. I'm really interested to see what they covered and what behind the scenes stuff of the coverage we're going to get. Um, and, you know, will we get the Gunther bit um, at, you know, at the, the end of the season? Will they have been able to, did they have time to tag that on at the end? I'm, I'm really, really curious. So I'm, I'm really yeah. excited for this to drop. Yeah, I think for us, it'll be mostly like, I can't believe they didn't cover this versus like, oh, I'm glad they covered this. I think that'll be more of our, our you know, topics of conversation, just knowing yes. us. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, anyways, that has been our season, our 2024 season predictions podcast. That's it for this episode. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.